Congratulations on completing Chapter 2, The Verbs of Programming. We called Chapter 2 The Verbs of Programming because it dealt with those metaphorical verbs. This was the sections where we learned about the actions and the changes and containers that our informational constructs that resemble nouns from Chapter 1 go through. But before we move on to Chapter 3, let's review what we've already learned in a recontextualized and abstracted way. Welcome back to our Python Pyramid. Now in this, the first of three review videos for Chapter 2, we're going to forget about the specific details and work our way up a more and more holistic review. And on this level, we're going to move quickly and focus only on the topics, mnemonics, and connections. So we're going to be looking for shared properties of these verbs of programming. Now let's take a single type variable as an example. Let's say an integer. So we first learned about specific operators that we can perform on this variable, like multiplication from the arithmetic family, for example, but tons of others. And we learned that we can even wrap that action inside of a conditional so that we only multiply, for example, if some condition was met. And we can use one of the other operators for that, like a comparison operator. Now let's take a group type variable as an example. Let's use a list from 1 to 10. So we learned about a particularly useful action of looping. And we learned that we can loop over each element inside of a list like this one by one. And then of course we learned about the granddaddy of all Python actions, a function. A function is a place where we can store an unlimited amount of logic. And this logic can be sub-packaged into other functions. And those functions can be passed into functions. And those functions can hold their scope, their namespaces inside of them as they're passed around. So a lot of powerful ways that we can use actions. So feel free to join me as we go through this video by pulling up the accompanying ebook, or just close your eyes and challenge yourself to follow from memory by walking through your memory palace as we take a step back and we walk through what we've learned on a higher level, the level of topics, mnemonics, and connections. Welcome to our chapter two review. Below you'll find the link if you guys want to follow along with the ebook. And of course, I always appreciate it when people ask for right access and help me uh, with my grammar and the spelling and answering some of these questions. So I love thought of this being sort of a Wikipedia style document. So please, you know, feel free to contribute to it. So we started chapter two with the verb that comes with operators. And the very first one, of course, was somebody who does operations in real life, a doctor, a surgeon. And if you remember, he needed to perform a quick surgery on that sheep. And that sheep, unfortunately, had been hurt while jumping fences. And that was our arithmetic operators. And the sheep represented the arithmetic operators because that's the operations we can perform that take addition. So adding two things together. But of course, there's more. But that was the one that reminds us of counting sheep. And that led us to our next one, which was the noble tick. And he represented our comparison or relational operator. And the tick was the operator that we would use between two variables to compare the two. After that, we moved on to a new story, which was our dog. And of course, he eats his homework every night. That's a big problem dogs have is eating homework. And he was the assignment operator mnemonic because we assign homework. As a reward for his noble work, he was awarded an ID to make a firefighter ID. And this ID represented identity operator. And remember, each of these operators are groups. After that, we moved on to the fierce debate between the Merrill Lynch gang member and Spock from Star Trek. We talked about how membership operators are able to tell if something belongs inside of a group. They apply to some of the types that were groups, like dictionaries, tuples, sets, etc. And during the negotiation, Spock ended up with a great deal as he forced that Merrill Lynch guy to put on a lie detector, and he found a good investment portfolio that worked for both of them. And of course, Spock represents our logical operators because he is a very logical person. And all of this was taking place inside of the area where the kitchen is, and after that, we went outside to learn more about conditionals was all about conditionals and that was broken into two subsections. We had the basics of conditionals and we had debugging. And we started with the sweet story of an air conditioner and how he was fixed by an elf who created him many years ago in the backyard. And he became so strong that snow is actually falling outside even though it should have been rain because he was one powerful air conditioner. Remember the concept of a conditional is easy to think of because we can associate it with what condition something is in. And it's the same concept in 
in programming, we're saying, what are the conditions that our variable is in? Or do we need to create the right conditions for certain logic? And that led us to the three main keywords. Of course, Anna, Elsa, and Elf for the if, else, and el if statements. And these three, if you remember, were sitting underneath the tree. And they were sitting on a bunch of snow, enjoying the very, very soft snow that the air conditioner created. And above them was our decision tree, a tree that started with no leaves whatsoever. It was all branches. And that's a great way to think of these decision trees because they're like branches. They're always starting in one kind of true, and then they break off into a false. And then they're a true into a false over and over and over again. And that goes right along with flow control, which was a bigger concept of how stuff moves throughout the tree. And that was the end of the first half of our conditional section. If it's your first time through, you probably didn't cover it. But on your second time, if you went a little bit deeper, we also talked about deep debugging in this section. And of course, the favorite debugging mnemonic is a ladybug. So we had a cool little ladybug who was really savvy and played the joker for a fool. And remember, we talked about debugging being more than just some action or some method, but it's actually a spectrum where you think of features and bugs on the same spectrum. A lot of people don't realize that. And if you remember, this ladybug was playing a game with the joker, and that game was Jenga. And Jenga was our mnemonic for the stack trace. And remember, the stack trace is something that we can print, and it can actually tell us about where our bug is, where the changes in what we expected are occurring. So they played this for a little bit. And then in the story, the next thing we learned was the joker who talked about exception handling, the buzzer on his hands. But first off, the way we have it in the ebook is to look at exceptions in general instead of exceptions handling. And exceptions represented by the mnemonic of a red flag, and probably China's flag, but as long as it's red, because exceptions are red flags. They're like, whoa, what's going on over here? Warnings that we should be paying attention to. And then to go back to where the Joker was playing Jenga, the Joker tried to trick the little bug into getting zapped with his little hand buzzer, and that represented our exception handling, which is the process that we go about. And the reason we put it in this conditional section is because exception handling is very similar to writing if else conditionals. We have these try and accept, which do sort of similar things, but are a little bit more specific and talk to Python in a way that's a little bit more helpful for the purpose of debugging. And speaking of some of the keywords that we would use when we're doing exception handling, that brought us to our raise and finally keywords, which were represented by our very brave woman raising a sword and protecting us from that alien invasion that was happening. If we didn't talk about that in this, but that's the aliens came down and put the, the red flag and we were trying to, you know, defend our Earth from them. But luckily she did and he didn't. This guy ran an entire marathon just to get away from that alien. He's a mnemonic also, so it's okay. He reminded us of runtime and compile time when we discussed the differences between the two. And when a computer is making an error, it will be in one of these two groups. And that brought us to the end of conditionals. Our next section was section eight on recurrence. And recurrence also had two subsections. We had loops, and then we also had iteration. And there's a whole bunch of different ways to think about recurrence, but by far the priority for this first time learning Python should be loops. So we learned about the Fruit Loops mascot, Toucan Sam, and his battle with diabetes over there by the beer pong table, because he just couldn't stop having so much freaking fun. I mean, but it's not good for you after a while. So he had diabetes and the Fantastic Five came to save him. And they represented a different type of loop. Perform a specific operation or logic for each element in some kind of group. So loops in general are the process of taking each item and doing something to it. For loops say, however big your group is, for each one of those, do something. And then the Fantastic Four had an internal argument after saving him from diabetes, and they kicked out their fifth member, and they became the Fantastic Four. They were actually the Fantastic Five before that. And then she went on to become her own hero anyways. She was probably better off without them, as she helped these two sloths by building a spoon catapult for them so that they could use their slow little sloth claws and then they could flick up a ping pong ball and try to play beer pong and they represented the while loop and the while loops pretty similar to the for loop it's another type of loop but we learned that the while loop happens while some condition is true. And this is one of those where as a beginner, you can easily get a bug that can freeze your system. Even with our Jupyter notebooks, if you, for example, say, you know, add one to the letter I, and then while the letter I is less than 100, do something. And then you didn't add it correctly, and 
it never gets to 100, and then all of a sudden you run out of memory. So while loops are also very powerful, but, but require a little bit more attention, I think, in my opinion. And then we were done with the first part of recurrence, and then we talked about much more advanced topics. So once again, if this is your second time through and you went a little bit deeper, iteration really broke down some of the specifics on how to think of recursion and iteration being different. And we use the mnemonic of a rocking chair and an animator. And if you remember, this was taking place over in that building. And our main takeaway from this was that iteration is the more general of the two. So all recursion is iteration, but not all iteration is recursion. Iteration is a specific way that a function will call on itself over and over again and then wait for some kind of solution to then solve the rest of the logic. Whereas iteration is just an overall term for going through things. So then next to where they were, something we covered before in the stories, was the mischievous cat litter box that always wanted to play pranks on people. He or she, whatever cat litter box is, was having trouble until met the jack in the box, the most sneaky of all. But let's stop and look at what it means for something to be iterable versus something to be an iterator, because the comparison on this document is really about the dog, which we'll meet in a minute, that got caught like a donut around a pencil and couldn't get out for the entire day until he fell asleep. But we'll get to that in a second. So let's talk about what an iterator is. Because an iterator is going to be a question about whether something can be ran asynchronously. Can it be paused and come back to later? Whereas if we're saying something is iterable, we're just saying, can it be looped over? So in this situation, sort of as opposed to the other one, all iterators are iterable, but not everything that's iterable is an iterator. And remember, in this case, we're talking more specifically about Python terminology or programming terminology that can be applied to variables, whereas before we were really talking about a more general term, recursion and iteration can be used in regular life. Although recursion does have to do with, with functions calling on themselves, it can also be in like a mathematical sense whenever something needs to solve its own thing over and over again to finally get to a conclusion and then go back up. This is the pyramid kind of concept versus this is the conveyor belt concept. And then you remember that animator went out for a walk and found that magical generator that powered the lamp that let him see color for the first time in his whole life. Oh my gosh, almost brought me to tears as someone who's red, green, colorblind. Beautiful, beautiful story. Now, the generator represented a Python construct, one that we could have probably covered in the first chapter, more of a noun, but it was a little more advanced, and I didn't want to put that in there. But the generator is something like a group type, but it has a special ability to pause and be restarted, run asynchronously. And the way we do that is with a yield sign. And the yield sign, of course, was what the dog got caught around when he grabbed his own tail. So those were our two mnemonics for generators and yield signs, or yield keywords that go together. And that was the end of the stories that we had, but just to reiterate what the jack-in-the-box that we mentioned earlier represented was the mnemonic for comprehensions. And we devoted an entire how video just to these because they're not conceptually anything different than what we learned above here, but they are syntactically much different. They are shortcuts. They are often single lines. In fact, we were able to solve the entire fizz buzz problem, a programming problem that you'll probably be asked on your first job in one line using comprehension. So very powerful when you see how easily you can put so much logic inside of one line. So we're back, and now we're talking about functions, arguably the most important thing, the thing that makes it so that we can build on top of other people's work and stand on the shoulder of giants, the function, which was represented by our gas pump rockers, or a gas pump in general as the mnemonic. We learned that functions are very powerful ways to capture logic, to pass it into other functions, to bring in with it the entire namespace that it's surrounded by. And when we bring in modules or we write other code that is going to take advantage of APIs, behind the scenes there's a long series of functions that are all calling on one another until we get all the way down to machine translation code and eventually binary. And we learned about these gas pump rockers, a, a high school group of gas pumps that was you know, going through that phase, but they ended up being real successful and really popular at their high school. In fact, so popular that one of those gas pumps went to call his mom, and when he went over to call his mom, he ended up getting in a very magical phone booth from 
Doctor Who, the TARDIS, turned out to be a magical spaceship that manipulates space-time in such a way that walking into the phone booth seems physically impossible, but there is a giant spaceship inside. And the TARDIS, or this uh, British-style phone booth, represented calling a function. One thing that's important that goes along with functions is calling them. Those are containers. And at other times in other places in code, we just want to write one little line that says, open that container and do whatever is inside of there. And we want to keep these things separated so our code can stay thin and still have tons of functionality. Now, even though it seems like these gas pump rockers don't have any problems, they're, you know, probably super popular at their high school now and, and living that, that life. We know that they had a group of managers that was getting a little greedy. They took advantage of those poor high school rockers. And those were the hungry, hungry hippos from that old board game just greedy, chomping away at every marble they can get. And they represented the concept of parameters. And these also go along with our functions because parameters are what we can pass in. And that's the reason we chose the Hungry Hungry Hippos because those marbles are basically being passed into their stomach. They're like chomping away and eating them up. And we can think of those as parameters going into a function. And for these, you remember over in the main dance floor, everybody was doing the Dutch dance kind of thing. And that represented our concept of star args and star star quargs. I just like saying that. And what that was is ability to change the way the parameters work. By default, of course, our functions are going to have one parameter going Going in per argument, but when we use star args, it allows us to use many parameters for a single argument, or in the case of star star quarks, many key value pairs, parameters and argument pairs that go in. So that was the end of the first half of our functions. And then we moved on to our second half, which was a little bit more complicated, more of a second level thing. But we talked more about the concept of nesting. So we knew functions could be inside functions, but we didn't know that they call them first class functions. And we used a mnemonic of a luxury airplane seat. And this referred to the fact that they're not just able to be contained in one another. They actually come with all of the same powers that all objects in Python do. And if you remember back to the story, this was what it was like inside of the Apollo 11 capsule. This is the first class experience they were living, which is very unlike real life, actually. Then, of course, we met our Russian nesting dolls in our story about Russia and the United States coming together for the common good. And these nesting dolls represented the broader topic of nesting, where we looked at the how videos for the syntax and really talked about when things can be nested and how that works. Then, of course, our favorite Apollo 11 lander that crashed in that backyard area that the door had to be pried open by. And that represented the topic of closure because it sort of in encapsulates all of the environment here on Earth as it goes into space. And it made sense to talk about that in the same way that we learned about how closure packages the entire environment in with it when we pass it from one function to another. So these are very these functions are more powerful than just Tupperware. They're like magic Tupperware that can pull in the entire room with them, all of the references in the namespace to all of the variables that they have access to at the time the box is closed. And of course, even though the Russians were working together with the Americans, if the Russians didn't give us the power to use the microverse battery, we would have never got that door open. And in response, the Americans gave the Russians a cake from Rick and Morty, one of my favorite TV shows. And that was our final mnemonic, which represented the topic of a decorator. And of course, these decorators are usually functions that are very general that we want to reuse over and over again and can be added to other functions by simply adding an at symbol and the name of the function just to decorate usually one last little bit of logic on top of something more unique. And that was the end of our chapter two mnemonics, connections, and topics. So why don't we abstract one more level and just simply review the properties that the different sections had in common in our next lesson. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our Mnemonic Academy YouTube channel for daily uploads that will help you learn amazing concepts through effortless associations.